That was good, y'all. That was good. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Hello, everybody. If you're able, please stand with us and turn in your red hymnal. Men, sing out just like you did. And the ladies, sing out too. It'll sound great. 157 in the red hymnal will sing the first and the fourth verse tonight. Trust and obey. seated. A few announcements. Uh, don't forget this coming Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, prayer time at 930, Bible study classes at 945, and then our worship time at 11 o'clock. Also this Sunday there will be just an all men's choir this Sunday. So you men, come ready. Y'all done good. You really did, so come on, don't lay out. You know I'll get you when you get back, so you might as well come on. But really, you sounded good, so remember that this coming Lord's Day. That's uh, Women's Bible Study this Saturday, right? 10 o'clock, Women's Bible Study, so remember that. Any more announcements? Anything I'm forgetting? I believe that's it. Do you have any announcements? If not, prayer time. Certainly the lost are at the top of the list. We'll need to remember those. Um, I ask that you continue to remember Jan Carpenter. She's over at the Mannery Hospital in intensive care. Uh, with congestive heart failure, you remember her. Continue to remember Kendra's grandmother, Patricia Lowe. Uh, did they move her yet? No, she's still at Northern. Still at Northern. Okay, so... Uh, they've got her on the ventilator, but she's doing good. It's just they've had her on it so long they thought they might have to move her to Forsyth for sort of a rehab kind of thing to wean her off of it. But maybe things are doing well right there. But continue to remember her and remember that family as you pray. Miss Connie, still remember her and her leg, please. Don't forget Mary Leach's brother. He still needs our prayers with cancer in his leg. Miss Adlin with her Cadillac that she's had fixed, remember her. How's she doing? Good, she's doing good. Okay, so, but continue to remember her with her eyes. Uh, Brother 
Brother Larry Slate with his leg, remember him. Marsha, still remember Marsha as you pray. David and Ruth, Charles, Vernon. Um, Sky, did she have her surgery? Remember her, remember Frenchy. We know he's failed, his back's sore and hurting, but you remember Frenchy. Remember Charlie's sister, still remember her, and Charlie as well. Peggy's mom and dad, still remember them. Luke, Mary Ruth, they've asked for your prayers and for their families, so you remember them. Others this evening, you go right ahead, Diane. I know you've got a couple. Yes, sir, Don. I'd like to remember my son. He's had an infected tooth for 42 days now. Oh, well. It's been operated on twice, and they're going to have to put him back in the hospital over the weekend mm. and do some experiments on him. Remember Don's son. Christy Halstead, she had surgery <coughs> Monday. They did get her home late yesterday afternoon. Do remember her still as she recovers. Whatever it is, the Lord will be right with you. Amen. Amen. Is there somebody else? I still remember my neighbor, Shane. My wife's got a husband. Just as in the days that he got uh -huh. all the way in here, our neighbor's sick. Oh, yeah. That's all I want to say. Oh, yeah. I just remember my neighbor. I know it's early morning, but they were saying, I feel like it might be Brother Shane. surgery infection in his leg her grandson got a good report we're thankful she mentioned him yesterday with nosebleeds took him to the hospital but he got a good report so we're glad for that <coughs> the diagnosis might have been too much coon hunting <laughs> but anyway. a show a little ago and i looked at it he asked about the first prayer one of his friends he's a preacher of it in mary north carolina david edwards found out he's got some kind of condition in his heart down and out about it and his doctor basically told him he couldn't I guess he's sitting in Florida's only been able to preach at his church and he's I think he's kind of an evangelist too he preaches you know throughout the year and he hasn't kind of come to much of anything yeah. so I think he's down and out yeah. remember, th remember this remember Jethro Think Is Lori Lee. I don't see. I think Ellie's got the flu. Mm -hmm. I heard that may be where she's gone. But uh, remember her. Remember that family. It may go through Luke and all of them. You know how that works. So Brad's getting sick too. So there you go. Starting to <coughs> run through. Anyone else?
they want it. Billy Lynn. Thank you, Buck. Appreciate your good humble prayer. Daniel chapter number 11 tonight. Now I'm going to jump to verse 37 just because it's on my mind. We're not, gonna, we're, not, we're not that far along, but I want to read this verse because this is referring unto the last of the A kings in Daniel chapter 11, and that is the Antichrist. Let's see what verse 37 says right here. Let me back up and read you the very last part of verse 36. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. I believe from what I've said, and from what I've read and tried to study about the Antichrist, is he will be a homosexual. He will not worship the God of his fathers, his forefathers, if you will. Now this fellow up here on the Democrat ticket, what's his last name? Booty something. <laughs> Booty cheese. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever he is. Listen, we, we mentioned it in prayer a while ago that it's so sad that our country has fallen to the level that even, I know it's just a primary for a certain political party. It's not the election. But still, if that can carry a ticket and we're just astonished at it and we can't understand why would anybody stoop that low seemingly in this land and yet we think gosh there's no way this man can become president I don't know I don't know I hope and pray that's not the case 
but you do not know what may happen. But why I've said that is back to the verse 36 there. At the very end it says, For that that is determined shall be done. That means God is on his throne. And if that man is elected as the president of the United States, you can rest assured it's not going to take God by surprise and that God's still in control of it. That doesn't mean that God will approve of it, but God may allow it. But I hope you understand the stage is being set throughout the countries of the world that how this is being accepted as a lifestyle the stage is being set for that day when the Antichrist will rise up to power of the world and he will be accepted. Amen. He will be accepted of it. Now, that's not the Bible study tonight, but you get that at no extra charge. Verse 24. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 11. Hey, I ain't going to tell you how to vote and what you ought to do. I mean, you ought to be praying about it. That ought to be, you ought to be deciding what God wants done, what you feel like God wants done for this country and how he would have you to vote. But I'll say this, and I'm not endorsing anybody, but for the first time in my life, we have a president that acknowledges God Almighty and Jesus Christ as Savior first sitting president that attended a pro-life rally and the first president I know of that has publicly come out and said that he would protect all preachers and pastors for freedom of speech amen mm -hmm. that's good pro-Israel amen so anyhow I know he ain't perfect he's human you ain't perfect and I ain't perfect either we human but anyhow, verse 24, we're back to Antiochus who? Epiphanes. And what does that word Epiphanes mean? Hmm? God manifest. Y'all excuse me a minute, I'm OCD, I can't help it. This door's open, I gotta shut it. God manifest, right? That's what Epiphanes means. Tell me a little bit about him. Is he evil? Deceitful? Evil? Yeah. Anything else you know about him? Where's he the king of? He's from the Seleucid dynasty. Let's review again. Alexander the Great <coughs> died. His domain was split up amongst his four generals. Out of that, two of the generals rose to the greatest power. They all fought amongst themselves. And you ended up with Seleucid king of the north, and who, king of the south, the Ptolemy, and who's caught in the middle on the battlefield? Israel, God's chosen people. So we've reviewed this, and I hope you're getting it by now. We've reviewed it about every Wednesday. There's been battles back and forth. The king of the south gets the upper hand. The king of the north gets the upper hand. They battle back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then we found out, I believe it was last week or maybe the week before, that Antiochus the Great uh, resorted to diplomacy, did he not? And he offered his daughter to the king of the south. Anybody remember what her name was? Cleopatra. Not the Cleopatra that we are accustomed to. Probably a great, great, great grandmother to the Cleopatra that we 
are thinking about or what first comes to our mind. He resorted to diplomacy, Alexander, or excuse me, Antiochus the Great did, and he hoped that by getting his daughter married to the king of Egypt, and they were both real young, y'all remember that? About 7 and 12 when it was engagement, and then about five years later it was consummated, made official. But Antiochus the Great's intent was that Cleopatra would side with daddy and he would be able to take over Egypt internally. But we know that backfired. Cleopatra sided with her husband who was Ptolemy the... Ptolemy number five. So, and then we know what happened after that. One came up in his place. He hadn't tried to raise taxes. Uh, and what happens, Antiochus the Great, let me back up, I'm getting ahead of myself. Antiochus the Great, he's embarrassed. He comes back, he robs the temple of his pagan idols. The people destroy him and he's never found. Then one rises up in his place who is a raiser of taxes because of such a war debt that Antiochus the Great has left, and because he tries to raise taxes, he's poisoned. So now, upon the scene, enters this one named Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse number 21 tells us that, and he will obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now let's go to verse 24 and let's try to cover a verse or two tonight if we can. And the Bible says, verse 24, he shall, well, I, I can't do 24 yet. Let's go back to verse 21. I want you to look from verse 21 through verse 23. I want you to notice what God's word says about the characteristics of Antiochus Epiphanes. Let's try to pick out some of these words, okay, before we get to verse 24. Starting in verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up, number one, a vile person. What does vile mean? Evil. Evil. Disgusting. Yeah, awful. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably. Now, wait a minute. How does that work? We got somebody evil, disgusting, mean as a snake, Who's going to come in and take the kingdom peaceably? Does that even line up? Hmm? Oh, wait a minute. That's how the devil works, isn't it? He's not going to come to you as that old fella in the red suit with the peaked ears and the pitchfork. He ain't going to look nasty and ugly to you. He is going to come to you as the most prettiest, most attractive thing to try to lure you to him. Right? Now let's notice something else right here. And he shall obtain the kingdom by flattery. Somebody said that a while ago. He did it with flatteries. Mm -hmm. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. That's the Jewish high priest at the time. And after the league made with him, he shall work. Here's the next one deceitfully you know what somebody deceitful does they're they're i call them compel, compulsive liars mm -hmm. i've run into some in my life and you probably have too they do such a good job of lying and they lie so bad they even believe their own lies yeah. uh, hello yeah huh I never have been good at lying. I can't say that I ain't never done it. I'd be lying if I didn't say that. Everybody's probably guilty of lying at some time, ain't you? Now, come on, take your halos off. You got a Christmas present sometime, and you really didn't like it at all, and you said, thank you, I love it. You lied. <laughs> you could have just said, thank you. You didn't have to say, I loved it. But anyway, the thing about lying is this. If you're going to be a liar, you better be real good at it. Because one lie calls for another, calls for another, calls for another, calls for another. And you better remember every one of them you've told everybody. Because if not, it'll catch you. It'll catch you. But a compulsive liar will say, I didn't say that. 
And actually, they will believe they didn't say it. You'd have three people say, you most certainly did say that. You most certainly did do that. And they'll say, no, I didn't. I've even, I've even had them look at me and say, I'll swear on the Bible I didn't do it. I say, we don't need that. Now, how do you take, if you're vile, and you take something of flatteries, which that don't add up, then you're deceitful. Sounds like today's politicians, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest about it. Ain't that what it sounds like? They'll stand on the platform and say, we're doing it for the people. We're going to make America the land it ought to be today. And if they get into office, they don't care about you. <laughs> Not one iota do they care about you. I was studying some more in the book of Ruth. Guy, and I'm glad God through his word can really open your eyes. <coughs> Did you know how God's way of taking care of the poor was? Because he truly was concerned and is still concerned about the poor. You know how God's way of doing it was? Leave the gleanings on the edge of the field so the poor could have it. But you know what? <laughs> that didn't mean you go hand it to them. They had to get in there and work to get it, to earn it. But God provided for them. If they were willing to get off their tail and do something about it, they could get some food. That's the way God deals with the poor. But the problem today is our government says, I'll hand it, hand it, hand it, as long as you vote, vote, vote. But I don't care about you, and you don't care about me. That's deceitful. That's flatteries. Hmm? I hope you see the kind of character this man's got. You would say, this is awful, if you was reading it back then. But today, you'd say, well, that's just normal. We're used to seeing that all over the swamp up there in Washington that he says he's trying to drain. He shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. What about it? How do you become strong with a small people? Mm -hmm. You ever heard the old saying, Charlie, that the squeakiest wheel gets the most oil? You could have a four wheel wagon three wheels running smooth but if the fourth one's a squeaking that's the one that's going to get the attention you don't pay no attention to the other three because they're doing what they're supposed to do what about what did you say his name was Buddha cheese <laughs> can't vote for that man I can't even pronounce it <laughs> but Buddha cheese he's going to come in there with a, with a small group they tell me that the gay and lesbian and the LGBTQZL corp, whatever they are, whatever they fly under, whatever flag, rainbow, and that's a, that's a, mm, that's pitiful. You know what the rainbow was given for in the word of God? God gave it as a covenant he would never destroy the world by flood again. And they turned that upside down and say that's their, that's their logo they go by. Well, I got news for them, Roland. They're trying to claim that the world will never get destroyed by flood again, and it won't. But what about the fire that's coming on them? Hello, go to the book of Peter. You'll find out about that. A small group. How can a man who is this lifestyle, running for president, getting the kind of votes he's getting with a small minority? Hmm? He's coming in. He's a vile person. I'm just telling you like he is. He's vile, he's deceitful. You say, how dare you call him vile and deceitful? I can if I want to, because the word of God says his lifestyle is an abomination in the eyes of God. Yeah. He's vile, he's deceitful, and he's taking it by flatteries with a small group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Christians better get to praying, and I'll tell you something else Christians better do. They better show up at the polls in November. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, we such a wonderful Bible Belt, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say. Yeah, they say we the Bible Belt. Belt's supposed to hold things together, ain't it? I don't know if we're doing too good a job of it. Are we? Preacher one time made the comment. He, he was from down in the Bible Belt. And he took a call to go up north and be a church planner. And he went up north for about 15 years and tried to plant some churches. And after those 15 years, he accepted a call to pastor a church back down here in the south in the Bible Belt. And some man come up to him, Caleb. They, they say this is a true story. Some man came up to him and said, I know that you are glad to be back in the Bible Belt. Hopefully things will be a lot better for you. He said, probably not. Said, what do you mean? You're back home where there's Christians in the Bible Belt and them people up north heathens. He said, well, there's one thing about it. The people up there where I was at, they'll tell you they're sinners. He said, down here in the Bible Belt, they'll tell you they're Christians and they're sinners. Let that sink in a minute. Let that sink in. Deceitful. Flatteries. Verse 24. He shall enter peaceably. Notice this. He's going to enter peaceably, but we're going to find out later he's going to leave fighting. Does that sound like the Antichrist? Antiochus Epiphanes in the Old Testament is a future picture of the Antichrist that is coming in the latter days. How is the Antichrist going to enter the scene over there in the Mideast? Peaceably, he will sign a peace treaty with God's people, Israel. And for three and a half years, he will enforce that peace treaty. But in the middle, he breaks it. Flatteries, deceitful, vile, strong with a small people. Would you agree with me today that the nation of Israel is a small nation in comparison to the world? Would you agree with me today that that nation is mighty, mighty, powerful because it is God's chosen people? Amen. And they're still going to be powerful and mighty, and the Antichrist knows that. But he'll come in and sign a treaty with them. I'll get the rest of the world off your back. He'll be strong with a small people did you know that the nation of Israel today is only about the size of the state of New Jersey that nation only accumulates about as much land as the state of New Jersey but ain't nobody messing with them are they a little bit afraid of them hmm? that's right Till God says, I'm putting my plan into play. In other words, if they try to mess with them today, and God says, uh-uh, I done wrote the book, he'll fight for Israel. But when the time comes, and God says, Israel shall be turned against in the midst of the seven-year tribulation, guess what? They shall be turned against. Because it's God's word. That is. That, verse 30, 4, 5, that, that is to be, is, shall be determined. God has already determined it. Questions, comments so far? He shall enter peaceably even unto the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done. Listen, he's going to enter right. I want to go, and I'm trying to slow down all at the same time. And that's hard to do. I just wring my hands. In the past battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, they have been acceptive of the Jewish religion. They ain't really messed with it. 
They really messed with it. But what they've done, Israel's been in the middle. They've been plundered, used, and battle fought, okay? And each side is trying to gain position through Israel, Palestine, that land. So now he's coming through the fattest places of the provinces, right through the heart of the, of the promised land, right? But he's going to do something that none of his fathers have done. He's not going to fight them. He's not going to steal from them. Well, hope you see the Antichrist in this. Huh? He's going to come in there and begin to shower them with money and gifts and this and that. He will win <coughs> them by flatteries. Mm -hmm. Setting them up. He's after Egypt. He's after the king of the south. But ultimately, he wants Judea and Egypt. But in order to set, him, set them up, he's trying to look like a nicey boy, too, to the king of Egypt. Mm -hmm. He's working his way towards the king of the south, Donna. Not really planning on fighting or, or don't want the king of the south to think he's coming to fight. He's going to try. He's just making... He's getting close to the enemy. Let's read some. Let's read some right here. Maybe it'll make more sense to you. Verse twenty-four: He shall enter peaceably even unto the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his fathers' fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. In other words, he is planning his next military attack on the king of the south. He is looking at some famous cities in Egypt such as Memphis and Alexandria, and he's trying to figure out ways. You know, if you want to take down a country, you take down their major cities, do you not? Hmm? If Russia wants to come defeat America, they're not going to start out by bombing Pilot Mountain. You understand? They're going to try to bomb Washington, D.C., or Los Angeles, or New York City. Is it that where they're going to hit? What about in Joshua's day? Hey, this goes back a long time. When Joshua and the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, and they crossed it at a time when the Jordan overflowed its banks during the during the rainy season, the people on the other side had already heard about God's people and what they'd done to Gog, uh, Og and these other kings on this side of the flood. And they decided they won't come across that Jordan because the Jordan's out of its banks. We've got some more time. But what happened? God parted the Jordan. And they marched across on dry ground. And you know where they went? They went right to the largest city right in there called Jericho. And God, you know the story. Hey, right, you know the story. Why? Because God told them to. But when they got over there and after they got that battle done, he'd already told them, I want you to destroy everything. Don't you bring nothing out. I want it all destroyed. And they took them some little Babylonian garments and a wedge of gold. Who did that? Achan. He's still aching. He took it and he hid it in his tent. God never told Joshua to go after Ai, the little bitty city, the little pilot mountain, if you will. But Joshua and that group of men decided we're going to go take Ai. And he went down there and that little bunch out of Ai ran them back, whipped them up one side down the other. Now, they just defeated the largest city over there, and one of the smallest has put them on the run. How? God didn't tell them to go. That's, if there's a lesson in that tonight, it's this, Christian. Don't you do nothing. Don't you do nothing. Don't you do nothing until you pray about it. And not just pray about it. You wait till you get an answer. Hello. You'll get yourself in a numerous, a mighty amount of fixes if you don't pray. And God will let you get right in them fixes just like Joshua and that bunch. And after that happened, what did, what did God tell him? 
Joshua started saying, what happened, God? God said, I'll tell you what happened. There's evil in the camp. And that evil's got to be put out of the camp. They found out who it was. Killed them, the whole family. Then God said, now go get them. This Antiochus Epiphanes, he is setting his game plan, his battle plan of how he's going to try to get into Egypt. He doesn't think Judea, he doesn't think the, the promised lands, that's going to be a walk in the park, he thinks. He's after Egypt. Once he gets Egypt, then he can just come right back through, stroll right through Israel and ain't no problem, right? Yep. Verse 25, maybe we can get this verse in. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. Now, wait a minute. Verse 23 says, and he shall become strong with a small people. Then he's entered with flatteries and, and shared the spoils and the riches with the people. Now the Bible says he's forecasted devices. He's planned his military attack on these cities of Egypt. And then it says, He shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Hey, the Antichrist's army is going to start small. But it's going to grow big. Is that an amen or I don't know or I haven't read it or I don't care? Either way, I promise you it's in the word of God. He will have probably one of the largest armies that's ever been assembled on the face of this earth. Contemporary. Explain that to me. I ain't putting you on the spot, but explain it to me. I go along with it. Flatteries. Hmm? Share the spoil. We're going to have a fundraiser. We're going to give everybody some money. Everybody in the church is going to be good. We're going to take care of your medical bills, take care of your house payments, take care of your car payments. As long as you're a member of this church, I promise you, you come be a member of this church and you give to this church and we'll make sure all your bills are paid. You say, y'all don't do that there at Victory. No. But that type of church he's talking about does. It's called a social church. There is a church right now, they call themselves a church. I don't know what you call them. It's called the Church of Scientology. It's out there on the West Coast. It's made up of movie stars and high-ranking people, and they got money, buddy. Huh? And they're doing good deeds. If, a, t if a, a hurricane hits Haiti, they'll fly in there and dump pallets and pallets and parachute pallets of food in there. Huh? Hey, the world's full of good works, but they're not full of Jesus Christ. There's your difference. You're right, Charlie. And the Antichrist, listen, the true church, I hear that, it's ringing, that means my time's up. <laughs> but anyhow, the true church is going to be raptured out before the tribulation begins. But guess what? For the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist is not going to mess with the so-called social church. He'll let them do their worship and however they do what they do. But I got news for you. Middle ways, Brandon, when he breaks that covenant with Israel, then he is going to do away with the social church and say, I demand worship. I am God. That's going to be an eye-opening experience for those that's on the world at this time. Now, you got to remember something. How many people's in the world today? Does anybody know? Give me an exact figure besides the whole lot. <laughs> the whole lot. That's the way I figure. That's the way I figure a bunch. 
All right, book said $7.5 billion. If, if, I don't know how many of those billions are Christians, but let's just say, for the sake of computing and mathematics, let's say $1.5 billion are Christians. And the rapture happens. That's if it happened today, I'm being hypothetical here, that would still leave six billion on the earth. <coughs> but did you know that during the tribulation, two thirds of the world's population will be destroyed within seven years? There's four billion people dying around this world within seven years. You say, whoa, 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 that's bad. Yeah, God judges sin, honey. We're under mercy and grace right now, and thank God for it. <laughs> but the mercy and grace is going to turn into the judging hand of God one day, Weather Channel. It's a coming. It's a coming. And Antiochus Epiphanes ain't going to stop it, and the Antichrist ain't going to stop it, and no president or world leader is going to stop it because when God puts it into motion, the book's already written. It already tells what's going to happen. And that's the way it shall be. People don't like it. Nobody don't dare because it's the truth. Verse 25. He'll stir up his power and his courage. Wait a minute. Why has he got to have courage? Well, you got to remember, he ain't fought the king of the south before. Antiochus Epiphanes has not fought the king of the south. The last battle was his daddy, if you will, Antiochus the Great, who got drove back by the king of the south, and it was so bad he plundered the pagan temple to try to get money for his war debt, and he was never found. Now, I'm going to tell you, that better give you, if you're going to try to go attack somebody, and your previous leader wasn't found, it's going to take you a whole lot of courage and boldness to go fight that next one, ain't it? He's got courage. He's got boldness. Now, wait a minute. He's deceitful. He's vile. He uses flatteries. Now he's courageous. Hmm? Now he's bold. What else here in verse 25? And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. Well, I don't know about you, but let's, let's look at this verse real closely. At the first part, the king, uh, the king of the north is coming at him with a great army. But then the king of the south is coming with a very great army and mighty army. You know what that tells me? King of the South's got the upper hand. He's got a better army. It's stronger. It's more equipped. Listen to this. But he shall not stand. Who will not stand? The king of who? The South. What does the scripture say? I believe the psalmist wrote it down. Some trust in horses, tr some trust in chariots, but I trust in the living God. You can put your trust in a military, a great military, a strong military, but if God says it won't stand, it won't stand. For they shall forecast devices against him. Let's go back to verse 24 at the very last of that last part of that verse it said and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time Antiochus Epiphanes was a very clever man he didn't strike the king of the south until he had his weaponry and his force ready to hit those major cities of the king of the south while Egypt sitting over there enjoying they won the last battle and they've got riches and they've got this 
and they've got a great and mighty army. And yet when the king of the north engages the battle and the king of the south comes with a great mighty army, the king of the south falls. Falls. I'm going to stop. This ain't the end. It's just another step in the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. So the last time we had Bible study, the king of the south was in control. Now we finish tonight, and guess who's in control? The king of the north. And that's God's doing. We'll pick up verse 26 next time. Any questions or comments pertaining to the Word of God? How about them few sheets of boards that go right there in the middle of Israel and Palestine? I'm sorry, Ernie, I didn't hear you good. Peace of. Peace accord. Well, they've been crying peace, peace, peace for years and years and years over there. Well, it's got two more years in August, basically. Who? Trump. Uh, Trump. This years. one and. Yeah. Okay. He's got the election this year over there. That's just one of those. You know, it's just for that. It'll be impossible. If they sign something, Ernie, just like these other peace treaties that the King of the South and the King of the North sign, they're useless. It'll last a little while, but the treaties will be broken. They're only worth the piece of paper they're written on. Hmm? You, who was that old cat? Had to, <laughs> it wasn't Buddha cheese, but <laughs> it's Arafat. Y'all yeah. remember Yasser Arafat? Yeah. Huh? He wore that old long cap. That, what I call that do-rag cap. You remember him? He's against the Jews. He hated them. But he claimed he going to be peaceable with them, wasn't he? All he wanted to do was destroy them. That's all he wanted to do. But you know what? He's dead and gone, Cody. I wonder who took care of that. It's no wonder, and I know who took care of it. Because that, that time is still to be appointed. And Yarafat, uh, Yasser Fat, or whoever he was, <laughs> used to be fat or might be fat, he gone. He wasn't in control. You got to remember, God is on his throne, people. God is the creator. Man is the creation. And the creation cannot tell the creator what to do. David, when the creator says, I've listened to you long enough, close your eyes and take no more breath, death has come your way, that's the end. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. And I don't care who you are, you're going to keep that appointment with death. And I don't care how big a power you think you got, how much riches you got, or anything else. Hey, Ronald Reagan was a great president of the United States. But you know what? He's dead. George Bush was a good president of the United States. He's dead. I'm talking about seniors. John Kennedy, a president of the United States, he's dead. Dwight Eisenhower, a war hero and a great president of the United States, he's dead. Nixon, dead. Carter's still alive. About 95 or 6 years old, ain't he? But you know what? It's coming. He can't escape it. Unless the rapture, yep, yeah, unless the rapture happens first, he will keep that appointment of death. At, uh, Crazy fellow over yonder in Korea. Huh? Kim. Kim. Okay, we'll go with Kim. He's going to die one day, too. He may not think it, but he's going to die one day. Poop. He's out of here one day. I mean, you name it. They're gone. They're gone. They're going to leave here. They're going to check out. And here's the thing. This is the sad part. 
if they're not prepared to meet God, if they've never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, they shall not enter heaven. And any of these past leaders of the world that have died lost without Jesus are in hell screaming right now, begging and pleading. They've never done, they never did that in their life over here. But now they're begging and pleading for Jesus to save them and get them out of there. But you know what? Now's too late. Now's too late. All right. I don't know about the peace agreement, Ernie. I really don't. They may sign something, but I believe if they do, in time it'll be broken. It won't amount to nothing. Politics is a powerful thing. It's a money thing. We're going to find out later in this chapter 11 before the Maccabean revolt and after the Maccabean revolt there was Jews that sided with the ungodly people because of they forsook their religion because of we're going to see that and I'm going to go ahead and close with this tonight. I'm afraid there's a lot of so-called Christians today that have forsook our God for the cause of. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. God bless every one of you. Appreciate you coming tonight. Be careful going home. Men, don't forget, Sunday morning, y'all singing. And listen, don't all pile up on the back row. <laughs> Just go about where you's at tonight, and it'll be good. <laughs> and there'll be some other men that ain't here tonight that'll be here Sunday, hopefully, and you can get them up there with you. Just tell them, if I'm going, you can go. Right? If Matt can go and he can't walk up there, if you can walk up there, you certainly can go, right? Amen. Looking for a good time the Lord. This ain't no show. It's about worshiping God. It's about serving God. But you come on. You say, well, I can't sing. You can't prove it when there's a great big number up there. <laughs> Sound like to me, y'all was all singing good. I don't know if you was or not, but it sounded good. Strength in numbers, ain't there? It sure is. It sure is. Brother Don Osborne, would you dismiss us in prayer? Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for the opportunity you gave us tonight to gather here and to hear your word. And thank you for Pastor Joey and the wonderful message he had brought tonight. We thank all those who sang tonight and brought the little song up to you. Thank you for each and one that's here tonight. And we remember all those who weren't able to be here. We just ask that you reach out and touch them. That they might be able to bring them here again. We just ask as we go home, you keep us safe until we return once again to hear you. This we do ask in Jesus' holy name.